Hello, what is going on, everyone? It is Brandon Robinson, your co-host, and you are listening to Doable Discipleship, the show that helps you grow. Now, listen, if you've been tracking along with us, you know, last week we released part one of our interview with Ken Ba, authored of Unhindered Abundance. We've had such a great time. I loved where that conversation was going, and I'm so excited to get into the rest of it today. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Ken, or if you're just now joining us, uh, Ken is a long time, long time Saddleback friend. He actually was on staff at Saddleback as a pastor at one point, but now he is a discipleship coach and a spiritual director and author of a few books. But the one we're talking about today is Unhindered Abundance. Again, it's out right now. You can grab it right now. Wherever you get books, it's also in our show notes. Wherever you find books, it's there, it's available, and I cannot recommend enough you going and getting it. So without further ado, I'm so excited to get into the rest of the conversation right now. So can you, you, you write in your book, I thought this was fascinating. <clears throat> neurons are birthed by thoughts. The more you think about something, the more neurons are developed around that thought and the stronger and more influential that thought becomes. Remember, thoughts stimulate emotions. Emotions affect decisions. And all these gears, that's referring to your diagram, um, turning together drive our behavior. And then you say, the longer you dwell on negative and distorted thoughts, the stronger and more toxic they become. Say a little right. about that. Because what we think about over and over and over again is what we move toward. And it creates, so think of your brain as a, like a vinyl record. You know, it's great that those are cool again because the younger generation knows what we're talking about, right? So a vinyl record has all these grooves in it and the needle that goes across basically just tracks with that groove. Well, in this very similar way, what you choose to think about over and over and over again creates grooves in your brain that become your default. And so if that's if those thoughts are all based on lies, then it's going to produce emotions that are all distorted and messed up. But if you're if you're reprogramming uh, those thoughts with truth, which is where scripture comes in, which I am a huge uh, advocate of memorizing scripture, meditating on scripture, because scripture is uniquely God's special revelation. And the more we are focused on what is true, the more effect that will have on us. But again, this is all left brain stuff, which is important, but we actually make decisions uh, out of our right brain before our left brain is even involved in the process. So that's why character formation uh, is largely a right brain dynamic and comes through different means than all the truth that we're talking about. Truth is important, but there is a relational dynamic that an emotional dynamic that comes out of the right side of the brain that if we don't address developing our right brain, then, and coming at this with a whole brain perspective where we're, it's a, balance essentially between your left brain and your right brain, then we're going to continue to miss the mark and live in this intellectual place where it's going to have very little impact on our true character. So let me try to break this down so it's a little easier to understand. When, you when you're faced with a decision, if you have to stop, and Rob, this goes back to your point, if, you have to, if your son is playing, uh, isn't being obedient, he's playing too much video games, you've told him not to, and he's still doing that, and you're thinking about, he's being disrespectful. He's not doing what I'm asking him to do. I, I need, you know, he doesn't realize that this isn't good for him long-term. That's all your left brain kicking in, making that rationale. But you're upset with him. You're frustrated with him because he's not listening to you. He's not respecting you. He's not obeying you. And if you have to think through all of that, you're going to have a different result. But normally that anger gets triggered. And the first, our first response is, God got it. I thought I told you to not, you know, to turn the TV off and get doing your homework or get doing whatever it is you're doing. We, we want our default in those situations to become like the fruit of the spirit so that they become patient. And if you wait until a situation comes up where you have to be patient and then try really, really hard to be patient in that situation, you're going to fail almost every time. 
you have to train yourself. And this is where I think a lot of Dallas Willard's um, is really helpful in this. You have to train yourself to become the kind of person that responds with patience in that situation. You have a new default. That default is a part of this right brain training where you are connected, you are uh, attached to Jesus. You know, Jesus alludes to this in John 15 as abiding in him. That, and there's a lot of other dynamics that we probably don't have time to get into in referring to joy and group identity and some of these other uh, aspects of this that are a, an essential part of transformation because our first response to something reveals our true character. And so we want to get to the place where we become the kind of people where our first response is a fruit of the spirit. And that's not something that's going to happen by willpower or by trying harder. It's something that has to essentially be programmed in. So let me just give you another example. If you're driving down the freeway and you're looking at your phone, which you're not supposed to do, by the way, and you look up and you see red lights, what do you do? You slam on the brakes. You slam on the brakes. So Brandon, so you don't think about, oh gosh, red lights. Okay, what does that mean again? Oh yeah, if I don't hit my brakes now, I'm gonna run into the person in front of me and then we're gonna have a problem. Somebody's gonna get hurt, my insurance is gonna go up. Oh gosh, I better hit the brakes. If you had to go through all that left brain stuff, what would happen? You'd, you'd be plowing, you'd back. plow on the person, right. right? Why were you able, without your left brain even kicking in, why were you able to slam on your brakes? That's a right brain dynamic because in your, your right brain is tied directly into that part of your brain that tells your foot to hit the brakes. And you don't have to think about it because you have already trained yourself that when you see red lights, you hit your brakes. It's not unlike riding a bicycle. Every time you get, once you learn how to ride a bicycle, you don't have to relearn how to ride a bicycle every time you get on it. Right. Or driving a stick shift. Once you know how to drive a stick shift, you don't need to relearn how to do that. How, why is, how is that possible? Well, it's because your left brain has automated all of that stuff. The brain is a very lazy organ. It wants to automate things as quickly as possible. It doesn't like ambiguity. It doesn't, it's very efficient. And so it's going to create subroutines that kick in based upon different scenarios and situations. It's like, uh, we just moved from our home that we lived in for 16 years. And so we were driving home one night and uh, as we were passing our normal street, Susan, my wife said to me, she said, she said, oh my gosh, she said, I was, I was ready for you to turn on the street and just, you know, go, go back to our house where we lived for 16 years because that was the automated routine that was in her house and in, in her, in her brain. So part of the way we rewire our brains, it includes scripture, of course, but it also includes this other work of right brain dynamics where we are addressing the bonding brokenness, the lack of attachment, the relational hurts, the emotional pain, all of that stuff. And when you bring those two things together, then you have a track for experiencing the, the abundant life in a way that seemed impossible before. That's, oh, that, that is so good. I, I love the, the illustration of driving, right? You don't, when I, when I moved to California, I had to retake, you know, the driver's test because I had a North Carolina license and I had to get my California license. And I remember thinking, being so frustrated, like, I don't know what any of these things are. But at the same time, I know what all of them are and I know how to drive and I don't know why I have to redo it. Um, but there's the familiarity of knowing how to drive, knowing what red lights mean, knowing what the different uh, traffic signs mean. It's just kind of in turn, you just, you just get it. You understand the more time you spend doing it. You're not studying how to drive. Um, you know, you're not, if someone were to say like, write a three page paper on, the stop sign, maybe someone out there could do it, but you wouldn't, you just know what it means. You know what to do. Um, and I think the spiritual life is similar in the sense of we need to cultivate time with God. We need to be with God, not necessarily study is great, but are we spending time with God? You know, I think about, um, this past year, I've really tried to made, make a commitment to practicing silence. Of, of getting quiet. Um, and I'll 
go out on our, our deck and the sun hits it just right in the morning and it feels really good and it's warm and I'll just sit there and be warm and think, and remind myself I'm, I'm with God right now. I'm, I'm in God's presence. Um, and similar driving, I think the more we do that, the more, like we talked about this fruit of the spirit, right? The more those things start to become real in our lives. You know, you, you necessarily, you might not be able to, Hey, go preach a sermon on the fruit of the spirit. Go preach a sermon on patience or self-control or goodness. You might not be able to do that, but it is becoming a characteristic in your life. It is happening. Um, people can feel it when they're around you. You are starting to notice that this is becoming who you are. Um, but that doesn't happen necessarily through kind of what you're like the left brain. I'm studying, I'm writing about it. I'm researching about it. It happens from almost organically by being with yes. God with no real expectation to do anything other than just enjoy his presence. Okay, so you hit on something really essential here. Character is more caught than taught. Mm. We become like the people, this is right brain stuff, we become like the people we are the most attached to, which is precisely why Jesus invited the disciples to come be with him. When Jesus says, follow me, he's not just, he's not just saying, come follow me around. He's saying, come be with me. The idea of discipleship in Jesus' day was to not just know what your rabbi knows, but to become like your rabbi. That was, that was implied in discipleship. And there were all kinds of disciples. The, the Pharisees referred to themselves as the disciples of Moses. John the Baptist had disciples. Jesus had disciples. You know, every rabbi had disciples, right? Jesus was referred to as a rabbi, even though he didn't go through the rabbinical schools like the Pharisees and others did. But Jesus invited them to come spend time with him. He didn't say, I'll meet you at the synagogue at 9 a.m. or we're going to start our Hebrew lessons for the day. So what Jesus did is he taught them about the kingdom of God, certainly through his teaching. When he was teaching the crowds, the multitudes, the disciples were there. They were hearing this teaching. But it, it, it was also an experience being with Jesus. So essentially, Jesus is saying this as his, you are my disciple. I want you to come be with me to, to see and learn and to become my people so that the things that my people do, you will become the kind of person that does those things. So for example, Jesus said that his people love their enemies. So Jesus is saying, come follow me. I'm going to teach you that my people love their enemies and then I'm going to model it for you as to what it looks like to love your enemies. And then you're going to get to practice it. And I'm going to kind of coach you through that. And over time, as we spend time together, right, this is that being with Jesus, that abiding in Christ. As we spend more and more time together, you're going to become like me. So that in the heat of the moment, you don't have to think about what would Jesus do. You're already able to do what Jesus would do because you become the kind of person that loves their enemies. Yeah. And you're speaking about attachment, right? Like the role of a, a, how, how attachment is so fundamental, especially on the right side of the brain. And it's, it strikes me as, and you have a, even have a chapter about how the role of the Holy spirit in Christ formation, but it's like, God knows uh, knowing us and the brain he designed so well. He's like, this is how much attachment is. I'm going to put myself into you because yes. you need to be disattached to me <laughs> Yes, <laughs> or else you will get attached to, you know, the things of the world. I sometimes think about uh, the temptations in the desert as almost Satan trying to have Jesus question his attachments. Oh, you know, for sure. You know, have and his you, identity, you know, have the world have, you know, have prove yourself. And Jesus is like, I don't have to prove myself. I don't need to worship any other thing. I have dad yep. and dad is all I need. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so, and that Brandon, you said a little while ago, just even today, you, you struggle with why does God love me? And we are so steeped in a performance world, right? Our, the world that we live in is all about performance. You, you study hard, you get an A. You work hard, you get a paycheck. You know, it's, it's all essentially tit for tat. 
it's difficult to not bring the same mindset into our relationship with God. But here's where knowing scripture is, is, is important in this regard. God's love for me, for you, has essentially nothing to do with you. It's about him. It's because he is love. Therefore, he loves you because that's who he is. So that's why when we are in Christ, there is nothing that we can do that's going to make God love us any more than he already loves us in this moment. Brandon, God loves you right now as much in this moment as he is going to love you 10 million years from now. Mm. I love that. That's, that's good. You know, you hear things like, and it's even in scripture, like God's unchanging. God doesn't change. or He's the same who he was yesterday. Um, uh, uh, tomorrow he's, as he will be today. And I think, um, but just w- when you say it that simply, right, you think about you're kind of putting a number to eternity because it's easy to think like, well, yeah, God will love me more than when I'm glorified and when everything's good, new heavens, new earth, this is great. Then sure. But right now the jury's still out. Um, and I think that was really well said to not just who God is, but almost like this, this is how God is. This is, he, he is love. He can't, he's not deciding or choosing to love. He is love and he, he cannot not be love. That would be denying himself. Yes. Um, and he, he can't do that. And that's not just a, a cognitive choice that he makes to not do. Like, it's who he is. It's, exactly. it's inseparable. Um, yes. And so you're the same, what you're talking about here is the same thing we're talking about in our own Christ formation mm-hmm. is that we are becoming, and again, this isn't going to be complete in this life. So I want to be clear about that, but we can make more progress than I think we realize. We are going to be able to become more and more like Jesus in his character, which is love, right? I mean, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But it's fruit singular, not fruit plural. So the fruit of the spirit is love. And then joy, peace, patience, all those others are just facets of that. So if you think of love as a diamond, all the facets of that love then reflect the various character uh, attributes, right? And it would also include things like compassion. That's not mentioned in there. It would include things like humility, humility. servanthood, right? These are other character Mm -hmm. traits that Jesus had that aren't listed in Paul's list of the fruit of the spirit. So it's not an exhaustive list, but it's becoming like him in his character so that we don't have to do a left brain thinking in order to, to, uh, to do what it is that Jesus would do. We become the kind of person that just does it automatically. That's, that's Dallas Willard's whole premise in his understanding of spiritual disciplines, that they are the spiritual exercises that essentially put us in a place where the spirit then can produce growth in us. We can't grow ourselves. We can't grow ourselves, but we can create a a climate, if you will, where growth Mm. takes place. So I liken it to the analogy of a farmer. A farmer cannot make a crop grow, but he can plow the soil, plant the seed, water the seed, fertilize the seed, and then the seed grows. So the farmer creates an environment where growth can take place and then growth happens. We have a partnership with the Holy Spirit and this is not a workspace salvation. This is what I call direct uh, participation in my book that it's one of the facets of Christ's formation because there is a partnership. Over and over again throughout the New Testament, we see that we are to put on Christ. We are to take off our, you know, our, our, our old self uh, we are to think about certain things. We are to, there's all of these commands uh, where we are to do things, right? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, it's not a works orientation, but it's a participation. The Holy Spirit, like I said earlier, is the primary agent of change, but we get to participate with him. One of the ways to do that is through the exercise of spiritual discipline. So Dallas's point is, as we do these, as we exercise ourselves in things like let's see let's say you want you need to become more patient 
So Dallas would say, one of the things that he did is that he would drive in the slow lane on purpose. Mm. So he would, then he would be paying attention to the angst that he was feeling, which is, you know, I knew Dallas a little bit. It's hard to imagine he had any angst, but you know, that he would be <laughs> paying attention to, to those things. And then over time, he just kind of acclimates to this, this patient mode where he doesn't react and respond in driving like he used to because he's become a different kind of person. That's what we're talking about. It's able to, he would put it like this. He would say, you're able to do something in the moment that you're unable to do otherwise. So it's one of the analogies I use in the book is uh, the, uh, when I ran the marathon, the LA marathon a few years ago. If I would have showed up on race day without having done any training, I wouldn't have been able to go more than a couple miles at best, but I trained for six months. So on race day, I was able to do something. I was able to run 26.2 miles because I had trained that I would not have been able to do if I had not trained. And so that same analogy works in our understanding of Christ formation and our participation in that. Would you say that, would it be right in saying God is not necessarily doing anything to us, but he is asking us to participate in what he's doing with us? I think God, I think God is relational. Everything he does is relational. He wants us to do, he wants us to do life with him. He -hmm. wants us to become more and more aware of his 24 seven presence with us. This is why, Brandon, I don't think God snaps his finger to deliver us from every difficulty. It's because he wants us to, he wants to walk through that difficulty with us. There's certain things about God's nature and character that you and I cannot know outside of suffering. How can you know that God is your comforter if you're never in pain? How can you know that God is your provider if you're never in need? And so at least in this life, there's this dynamic of contrast that enables us to know things about God in times of suffering and pain and difficulty that we can't know about him otherwise because he wants to walk with us through those things. He doesn't want to just snap his fingers and deliver us from those things. He certainly could do that. And there's Mm -hmm. times when he does, but the majority of the way God works is he is with us and he is helping us as we go through it. He's giving us the strength to endure the peace and all that we need. He gives us all the resources we need to get through those things. He won't give us anything that we can't deal with. And so the more we are focused on his presence with us, the more, uh, and in his presence, David said, there's fullness of joy. So this is a whole nother dynamic of this is that essentially our brain is designed to look for joy. Our joy is what our brain runs on. And it's joy, it's relational joy. It's not some feeling. It's being with somebody who's delighted to be with you, flips that switch in our brain for joy. The more joy we have in our bucket, if you will, the more able we are to be resilient in times of suffering and difficulty and hardship. And so when we are with him, present with him, mindful of all of that, of his countenance upon us, his face, his eyes of love toward us, then that, that, that's part of what fills our joy bucket. And then it gives us, it gives us the ability to do things that we just don't have the ability to do otherwise. It's interesting too, how much you can find that in the Bible when you start to look for it. Yeah. That God's face looking, I mean, the famous prayer of Aaron, right? Of like, God, look on on you, right? Yeah. Just the Psalms filled with God, look at me, you know, smile at me. It, and it's, again, God knows this, right? He knows our brains are wired for joy. And like then fills the Bible with his word telling you, I am looking at you because part of that we're connected. We're bonded. You are my child. I am in you. You are in me. And I'm looking at you, watching you. And I, I, I think that one of the greatest gifts, you know, is whether you either have kids or you have family that have a baby and that to be able to look at that and think this is what God feels times 
infinity yeah. about this baby, yeah. you know? And like, mm. to just sometimes think about ourselves as like, I'm just going to be a baby today. I'm going to lay on the couch and I'm just going to feel God looking at me and just loving me, him filled with joy, me filled with joy, connected, bonded in that presence. And it, it makes me think about, you know, we, we have, we spend a lot of time talking about the disciplines of, of study and the word and memorization. And all of those are super, super important. This conversation does not even happen without us thinking, using the minds that God has given us, our rational, logical intelligence, the left side of our brain. But the disciplines that help us feel God's presence and his nearness are ones that aren't typically practiced uh, by many people. And Brandon, you were like alluding to it too, like solitude, you know, like getting in a place where it can just be you and him. It's not about, you know, you're not doing a word study, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're just with him. Um, and I, I don't, I think there's, there's sometimes there's a disconnect with like, we, we want both sides of the coin, but we have some really robust ones for one side, but the mm -hmm. other side of the coin where it's, you know, prayer, but even sometimes our prayer is, well, I'm just going to say these prayers. I, I'm not really, it's not like I'm having a conversation and listening and can you even refer to that in your book. Like, Hey man, <laughs> you want to have a conversation? How about this thing called listening, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was taught, like a lot of us were taught the acts prayer, right? Adoration, confession, yes. thanksgiving, supplication. And all of those are great. But what, where's listening? You can't have a conversation with somebody unless you're listening. And so this is not a monologue. It, prayer is not a monologue. It's a dialogue. And because God is real. He is alive. He is right here with us. We just don't have the physical eyes to see it. We see him through the eyes of faith. We can experience his presence with us through the work of the spirit in our, in our lives that, you know, this isn't all hocus pocus. This isn't hocus pocus, man. This is, this is robust biblical theology. One of the things that I get to do is take guys to Montana, to a ranch in Montana for five day discipleship retreats. And uh, we have six of those planned for this year. This is my 11th year doing this. And I tell you, it's astounding to me when you get a guy up, to, up at the ranch and it's just a beautiful place. It's a 2000 acre ranch, it's spectacular. And after about 24 hours, some, sometimes it takes a little bit longer but they kind of start thawing out. And we have, there's three dynamics of the week that is just kind of our rotation. We have time in the word where we're teaching and doing, instead the, we're teaching and studying principles of discipleship and following Jesus. There is time alone with God and time together in small groups. Those are the three things that we do every day for five days. And at the end of the week, we have an evaluation. And they have spent more time alone with God. Most guys have spent more, even the pastors that come up to this, and I've taken a lot of Saddleback pastors with me up there. Uh, they end up spending a third of their time over five days alone with God. It's hours and hours and hours. And it's still the number one thing after they get into, into that and experience that, they're like, I needed more of that. I needed more time alone with God. And it blows me away because, you know, these are most of the people that we, that go up there are, you know, normal people, teachers and police officers and businessmen and, you know, doctors, dentists, they're just, just regular Joes. And, and when they start experiencing the intimacy with, with Jesus that is available to them, just walking through the woods, being, being, talking with him, being alone with him. It is, it is life-changing. It's astounding. I think that's God created us to be in relationship with him and to be in relationship with each other. I think that is the ultimate purpose of life. The ultimate meaning is being together. And I think that's what we're going to experience for all eternity. Yeah, you have a chapter on spiritual disciplines to heal the heart. Um, and there, there, there are things that the people who've listened to this podcast have heard before. We, you know, we've talked about the value of solitude. I, I love you have a quote in here from Henry Nouwen, though, that Henry Nouwen calls solitude the furnace of transformation. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But talk about some of these disciplines of the heart, like solitude and prayer and silence and even confession. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, confession is a, let's start with that one, Rob, because a lot of times we think we limit confession to confessing our sin. And certainly it includes that. But confession is also involves sharing with someone else the truth about me and my life and the things that have happened to me. So one of the reasons I believe that's a spiritual discipline that helps heal the heart is because if you go to James 4, as we confess our sin one to another and pray for each other, we are healed. The wording there certainly includes uh, sins that we have committed, but it also includes sins that have been committed against us. And when we are sinned against, we are wounded. We also wound ourselves when we sin. But part, so part of the healing and part of the process of healing is sharing those things with other safe relations, other people that give us, I refer to it as safe feedback. Safe feedback being love and empathy, compassion, understanding. Uh, it's not, if I'm confessing some sinful behavior to you, it's not that you are endorsing that sin. It's not that you are saying that that sin is okay. But what you're doing is you're showing me empathy. You're showing me love. You're showing me compassion. You're looking underneath as to what might be driving that sin. And this is a, this is a big deal because I think we focus way more on our sin than God does. Because the moment that we are saved, our sin is cast as far as the east is from the west. I don't think God is going over our sin over and over and over again. We get fixated on that for some reason. I think that it potentially is part of spiritual warfare, because a lot of sin that we stu- that we get stuck in, or that we commit as believers, is less about active rebellion against God and more a result of coping with and dealing with unresolved pain. Let me just give you a biblical example of this. It's clear in scripture that the king of Israel was to only have one wife and that any, any, any uh, act of polygamy was disobedient. David had seven wives and yet God never disciplined David for that sin. What did God discipline David for? There were, there were three specific sins that God disciplined David for. His adultery with Bathsheba and the ultimate murder of her husband, Uriah, and counting the troops. It's interesting when David was counting the troops, essentially he was was trying to see what his fortification was to protect himself. Instead of trusting God, he was putting his trust in his army, right? And Joab, who was his commander in chief, who was not a pillar of virtue by any means, said, David, this is a bad idea, David, don't do this. And, and those, were the, those were the three things that God disciplined David for severely, but they were not the only sin that David committed. Why did David have seven wives? Well, we don't know exactly, so I'm speculating here, so I want to be clear. I believe David struggled with, with abandonment and rejection big time, mm-hmm. and I think it goes all the way back to his childhood. Remember when Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel, right? He comes to David's house. His, his, his dad, Jesse, is there with his brothers. And David is not even referred to. David, oh, yeah, there is one more. But he's just a shepherd boy. He's just out watching. the. the he, he certainly can't be. Samuel's like, call him in. And, of course, we know the end of the story. That was not the first time that David had been marginalized in his family. I will almost guarantee it. Mm. I think David experienced tremendous rejection in his family of origin. There's even the possibility that he was illegitimate. That's a whole nother interesting possibility uh, as to why that might've been the case. But I think David was very, very wounded. And that's not something, and again, I'm speculating, I'm reading between the lines, but when you see how God dealt with David and worked with David, it wasn't that his sin of multiple wives was okay. It was still sin. But for some reason, there is a specific grace that God had for David, maybe because he knew David's story. I wonder if there is 
three aspects of grace that we experience. There's the grace by salvation through Christ, which is, which is the gift, right? It's just the gift of grace. Then there's grace that is essentially fuel unto Christ's formation, right? It's the, it's the fuel that drives obedience and all these things, right? Those are all grace sustained dynamics. <clears throat> and then I wonder if there's this personal grace for each of us where God deals with us specifically because he knows our story. He knows why we do what we do. He knows why, when we're acting out in pain and when we're acting out in rebellion. And there's a different response than, and a different kind of discipline that he, 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 he gives us. When my kids were little, trust me, there was a different consequence when they were being rebellious than there was when they were tired worn out and acting out because you know they had stayed up too late or whatever because there was an understanding on our part that there's something else driving this behavior than just this willful rebellion but we tend to treat all sin as this willful rebellion and again i'm not saying sin is okay right sin is sin right but it's interesting to consider that possibility i think we could also look at the example of abraham um isaac and jacob right Peter. I mean, you can just pick your person. And I think how they lived their lives and the things that they did were a result of other things that were going on in their past. They didn't just, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Yeah, that is, that, it, that's really interesting to think about. Um, what you're saying about the different types of discipline or God even relating to us in that way of understanding where a behavior is coming from. Um, and sometimes it needs to be nipped in the bud immediately. Sometimes it's a much larger, more drawn out process, um, but they're both born out of compassion. Um, I'm wondering, as we wind down to a close, I'm wondering um, what are some of those other exercises um, that we could be doing to kind of one help us become more aware of the spirit in our lives. Um, but also like you're saying, participating with God, kind of cultivating the right condition for us to become, uh, who God has created us to be. What, like, are there any other exercises that you have right up the top of your mind that you go, I always refer to these. These are so good for people, people to be doing. Yeah, so I have, there's two specific chapters in the book that, that deal with spiritual disciplines. One, Rob, two is healing the heart. The other is rewiring the brain. So like I said earlier, I'm a big proponent of scripture memorization because of how it rewires our brain. And as we are memorizing scripture, we're also meditating on it. That's, you can't memorize something without meditating on it, right? Going over it and over it and over it. So I think that's a big, big uh Probably, and Dallas actually said, of all the spiritual disciplines, if, there, if I was to only practice one, he said it would be scripture memorization. And uh, my wife and I have really taken that to heart. Uh, my wife has sexual abuse in her background. And she's really worked hard over the years in recovery to, mm. uh, to work through that, that trauma. And of all the things that she has done, and these are all these are all cumulative, so I think they all work together. But it wasn't until a few years ago that she really started memorizing scripture. And she memorized the book of Ephesians, the entire book, all six chapters. It took her two years. But what I that process happen. And we had note cards, and I go into uh, in my book, I get I give specific ways of memorizing. I have a whole section on how to memorize scripture by accident and all this kind of stuff. Cause that's one of the most intimidating disciplines there is, right? People like, Oh, I can never do that. I can never, my wife would tell you the same thing, but she just stayed at it. And there were no cards everywhere in the house. She'd had stacks by her bedside. They were all over the mirror in our bathroom. So I couldn't even see myself brush my teeth. They were in the car, they were everywhere. And she was just constantly going through these note cards over and over and over again, just creating these new neural pathways in her brain that when Satan would try to bring on the shame and the fear and all of that, she had all of this scripture that was just immediately accessible to, to address it. And 
Remember, when Jesus was being tempted to believe Satan's lies, how did he respond? With scripture. scripture. Yeah. So I believe scripture memorization is huge. I also would say, uh, you we've already alluded to it, silence, solitude, spending time alone with God. Prayer as conversation. Uh, I mean, you, there's many ways of, of, of praying, and I think they're all fine. But I like, I like to think of prayer much more today as a conversation between me and the Lord than it is a specific time where I carve out a half an hour, get on my knees and pray. Now, that's, that's great, right? I'm not minimizing that. But I, I like to think of prayer as my ongoing conversation with the Lord throughout the day. That it's this, you know, hey, Lord, help me with this. Or what do you think about that? Or, hey, thank you for this. This is awesome, right? Just like it's my best friend sitting there with me. When I was writing this book, there, there were many days where I did not want to write this book. You know, everybody thinks being an author is sexy. It is not. <laughs> it, is, it is just flat out hard work. And it's intimidating. You're putting yourself out there. So you're opening yourself up for all kinds of rejection and misunderstanding. And it's, it's a nightmare. And so I'm writing this. And the same thing was true when I was writing my dissertation. And I actually put on a note card and stuck it on my computer that says, I'm writing this out of my love for God and for his people. And it was my hope and prayer that God would take this work and put it in, a, in, a, in an accessible way that people could actually know how incredibly loved by God they are. And how there is a quality of life that is available for them that uh, is so accessible and they don't have to stay stuck in their, in their sin, in their pain, that there is a way out of all of this. And that's just what I feel so committed to. And so all these, all this information that's in this book, I hope all points us to relationship, both an ongoing dynamic relationship with Jesus and an ongoing dynamic relationship with each other, because that's what we need. That's what God created us to need to crave. And that's what brings about true change. And so, you know, when we talk about the spe our specific acts of exercising and such, the more we can do those things in relationship and context with other believers, the, the, the more I believe things will stick and it will produce an outcome that we scarcely imagine possible. I liken, uh, there's kind of like a tagline throughout the book that talks about there's more love, there's more love, joy, hope, and peace available for you in Christ than you ever dreamed possible. Mm. And uh, I think that's what the abundant life is. And so much of it is the result of relationship with, with him and with each other and doing life together. I think that is really well said and a great place, um, a great place to wrap up. Um, really beautifully said, Ken. Quickly, uh, Ken, for those who are like, this interview has been amazing. This is what I've been looking for. I need more. Where can, where can we find your book? Uh, so you can find our book on our website. Uh, IDTministries.com is our website. We, uh, it's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and pretty much wherever you, ever you can buy books. You know, I just want to uh, give a shout out to NavPress. They have been amazing to work with in this process. My publisher, Don Pape, he's the one that helped make this possible. David Zimmerman was my editor. He was incredible and really helped me think through things in a way that uh, I was amazed at his grasp of the material. Uh, I just had so many people on the team at Nav Press that really helped make this book happen. No book is written in a vacuum. Uh, we have a whole community of friends uh, that we do life with, that without them, this book never would have happened. Uh, so it's, it's, it's easily accessible. We're going to be developing a lot of uh, other resources around the book. Um, we're going to be launching a, a Unhindered Abundance podcast. We're going to be doing some follow-up 
devotional works, uh, workbooks, and various things. And we're, gonna, we're making all of that available on our website. So that's that's all stuff uh, that's that's coming. Rob, you had something awesome. you wanted to say. I thought I saw, I saw you light up. Over. I was just uh, that also it'll, the book will be listed on the saddleback.com slash books um, there as well. Yeah. Uh, yep. It'll be in our show notes too. Guys, we promise you won't miss it. We will have places for you to get it. Don't, don't worry. Um, and as always, this is doable discipleship. We always end on a doable. Um, so this is our doable for today. Number six, 24 through 26 is the priestly blessing that Rob mentioned. Um, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the, more, may the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Here's the doable. Uh, read that, memorize it. And as Rob said, let's talk, try to find some time today to be with God, be a baby. Let God look at you. Let God smile at you. Let God give you peace. So read that better yet, memorize it. And if you can't do a day, try an hour, try 30 minutes, but schedule some time where you can get away to just be with God and to receive from him with no expectation. Um, that anything needs to be done, but, but let God bless you in that way. We love you. We're always praying for you. Gentlemen, any last words before we wrap up? No, I just thankful for, uh, for Ken, for being, well, one, he's poured into a lot of pastors at Saddleback. So grateful for that. And, uh, personally grateful, but the book, uh, the title says it alone unhindered as you can get unhindered. And there's things that Saddleback, small group, Celebrate Recovery, the practices you've heard us talking about on this show. And this book, you know, kind of gives us a map to that. And that's why it was so valuable to be on that. The abundance is there. And don't, don't let things stay in the way of that. You know, there are things we can do. Email us, maturity, saddleback.com. You know, we want to we walk with you guys through this. But the, the title of Ken's book says it all because, and you'll find out in the book, Ken has walked this road um, and uh, now he's helping us do it too. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. And I appreciate just Pastor Rick's friendship and trusting me, you know, to, to bring a lot of this material to the, the Saddleback team. And it's just, it's an honor and privilege to partner with you guys in all of this. And so, you know, thanks for this time too. I really appreciate it, Brandon, and your thoughtful questions. And I see you and I don't know each other super well, but I see in your eyes, just this really deep hunger for God. And I love that. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. That means a lot to me. All right, you guys, we love you. We will be back with you again soon. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes and go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events lastly you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com send us your thoughts send us your questions your bible questions your life questions whatever who knows your question might just inspire an upcoming episode thanks again for tuning in to doable discipleship i'm jason whelan and i hope you'll join us again next week